بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضي وجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني من نور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا فزاء نعوذ منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم As we mentioned last, week, last session uh, we are going to continue our discussion with explanation of the difference between ethical theory and applied ethics so there are different ways to explain this and I found uh, something interesting mentioned by one of the contemporary moral philosophers James Rachels James Rachels says that you know he has a he has an article called ethical theory and bioethics in a companion to bioethics and he mentions that there have been different opinions different understanding about this some people have had the idea that it is the straightforward application model a straightforward application what does it mean it means that when you have your theory you just apply it to particular cases you know in logic we have qiyas deduction what is qiyas in logic to apply a universal rule or a universal statement to particulars so these people have taken it to be just a matter of a straightforward application for example you say what makes an action good is the maximum pleasure for maximum number of people suppose this is your theory maximum pleasure for maximum number of people or at least the least pain for the least number of people then when you come to an issue about abortion about cloning about suicide about environment about genetic enhancement what you do according to them you just apply this universal rule to those particular so you have to see abortion is an instance for bringing maximum pleasure to maximum number of people or reducing pain at least if it's not bringing pleasure or not very simple the reality is that this cannot do justice and applied ethics is much more than that it's not enough to know the theory and just apply it to the particular cases it's much more than that the second model is the model that he calls the physics a slash car mechanic model the physics slash car mechanic model 
imagine you are in need of repairing your car your car needs to be fixed you take it to a garage the mechanic is going to fix your car for example the engine of the car needs to be fixed the way the engine works and the problems which can happen to engine all are based on the laws of physics everything there is because of something that you can learn in physics some of them can go even further and be about chemistry but at least about physics why your speed is low why for example your engine consumes more petrol so everything is about physics but does mechanic need to know physics does mechanic need to study physics and get a degree in physics no although whatever the mechanic does depends on certain things in physics and those who designed the engine they were aware of those things but a mechanic doesn't need to know the physics as a discipline therefore they say those who are specializing in applied ethics they just need to know how to fix practical issues in that field like nursing ethics medical ethics bioethics gene ethics cyber ethics it ethics business ethics they need to know how to fix things there but they don't need to know the upper hand laws of ethical theory okay this is better than previous model but because it realizes that the issue is not just applying a universal law to its particulars but this is not again doing justice because a mechanic may not need to know the science of physics but in our case any person who specializes in applied ethics must know very well ethical theory you have to decide which type of ethical theory are you a deontologist are you a teleologist are you for example among teleologists are you a utilitarian or not you have to choose and based on that you can make decision so there is a third model which is better according to Rachel's this is the model which is acceptable and that is the biology slash medicine model the biology slash medicine model when someone is ill doctor has some knowledge of biology and he also knows about health and illness and issues related to that you cannot find a proper doctor who doesn't know anything about biology of our body any person to become a doctor has to go for training and one of the things that doctors learn is biology even those who want to go to university to study medicine in higher school they have to study definitely biology so doctor is not like a mechanic a mechanic doesn't need to know physics but doctor needs to know biology but to know biology is not enough if you have expert in biology it's not a still 
a doctor. Doctor needs to know more. Doctor needs to bring biology of human body to help him in understanding the way our body functions when we are healthy and the, ba the way our body functions when we are ill, the symptoms for illnesses and what is the treatment, all these things. So this is the third model. I was thinking that perhaps for us, we have another model which can explain better and more clearly for us. And we can say that is the relation between fiqh and jurisprudential maxims. You know, we have knowledge of fiqh and any person who studies fiqh and becomes for example a jurist, a mujtahid if you ask him any question he can investigate, he can examine and maybe come up with a fatwa with an opinion but if you want to have a more reliable fatwa, you need to know all the jurisprudential rules or maxims al al that are related to that field, all the major hadith related to that field, all the fundamental fatwas related to that field. You know, imagine someone is much ahead, but has not worked, especially in the field of qadha, kitab al qadha, about judgment, has not worked, but he knows all the fiqh uh, in general. But so far has not exercised ishtihad in Kitab al -qadha. This person, if you give him one issue and he works on it, maybe he come up with a fatwa. Maybe he can make up his mind and says, this is my opinion. But realistically, this person's opinion is not necessarily very strong. Why? Because if you spend some time on different issues in Kitab al qadha if you read it from the beginning to the end and know all the rules which apply there, all the major hadiths, opinion, you choose certain foundations or basis, certain mabna for yourself, you are in much better position to issue fatwa or to form an opinion about a particular issue. Therefore, my understanding is this. In the same way that there is a difference between someone who is mujtahid but has not worked in a particular field and another person who is much ahead but has worked in a particular field. The same is about theory of ethics and applied ethics. You can be expert in ethical theory, but if you have not really looked into a certain field, your understanding might be very uh, naive or very much early stage in the early stage undeveloped you know imagine if someone has worked on philosophy of akhlaq but has not worked really about bioethics 
about gene ethics, about business ethics. He knows teleological view, the ontological view, he knows the issue of, I don't know, relativism, all these things that we study in ethical theory. He is old problem, everything. But this is not enough to be able to give a sound and balanced opinion about applied ethics in different fields. This is why we need people who know ethical theory. You cannot bypass that. It's not like a mechanic that can bypass learning physics. No, you have to know. And it is more than biology also for a doctor. You really need to know your ethical theory. But you need to also know all the particularities of that field. Therefore, maybe you are an expert in one area or two areas. Maybe you are an expert in bioethics or medical ethics. But when it comes to media ethics, it's new for you. It takes time till you can have a comprehensive, reliable view. When I was in the end of preparation for my thesis for PhD, because, you know, as you know, I was working on ethical relativism, which is about ethical theory. So around 99, 98, I finished in 2000, but around 98, 99, so in the second, third year of my PhD, I came to this conclusion, alhamdulillah, that I have to move to applied ethics. It's not enough to just work on ethical theory. And also I had the impression that bioethics is going to be very important. Even some people have said 21st century is the century for bioethics. So I started collecting materials, Islamic, non-Islamic, about bioethics. And when in 2001 I came uh, back to home, I started teaching in addition to ethical theory, applied ethics, and in particular bioethics. And I encourage many of our uh, brothers to do their dissertations on bioethics. Then I started working on environmental ethics. And you know today, environmental issues are very, very important. So, alhamdulillah, we managed to have many dissertations and theses on uh, bioethics and environmental ethics in Qom, in Tehran, in different places, as well as medical ethics. And I think this has to continue. We need to work on different areas of applied ethics. And you cannot just have very general idea and, you know, present Islamic view. You have to really go into these fields see what are alternative views, what are their arguments, and reflect on them, and then go back to Islamic sources and try to come up with Islamic understanding. You cannot just be satisfied with the knowledge that you have of faith or even philosophy of akhlaq. No. You have to work in these fields because there are so many issues and you know arguments and counter-arguments. So, in my understanding, the model which is helpful for understanding the relation between ethical theory and applied ethics is the model that we have in our fiqh, in our jurisprudence, between general fiqh and abwab fiqh, different sections of fiqh in which certain jurisprudential maxims apply, certain uh, hadiths are important, certain uh, ideas you have to form as your basis, as your mabna, so that you can understand. I have uh, here a quotation I would like to share with you. There is a good book in Farsi 
اخلاق کاربردی it's written by some writers جمعی از نویسندگان by some writers published by پژوهشگاه دفتر تبلیغات on page 47 it says میان اخلاق کاربردی و اخلاق هنجاری رابطه در خور تعملی برقرار است there is a relation which needs reflection between applied ethics and normative ethics از یک نظر اخلاق کاربردی شاخه ای از اخلاق هنجاری است from one perspective applied ethics is a branch of normative ethics because you are going to understand what is right what is wrong and this is normative ethics منتهی در اخلاق هنجاری بران هستیم تا پایه ای ترین احکام اخلاق و عام ترین معیار خوب و بد و درست و نادرست را به دست دهیم but in ethical theory in normative ethics we want to go to the basic principles and rules and say what makes an action good is it outcomes is it i don't know the action itself is it virtue what is it so we want to go to the most basic rulings of akhlaq amma akhlaq karbordi be bahs az hanjar hay akhlaqi dar mawarid khas va karbordi mi pardazad but in applied ethics we want to find out moral norms in particular cases and in an applied way for example آیا مجازات اعدام در ملع عام عملی اخلاقی است؟ Is it a moral action to execute someone in public؟ آیا می توان شخصی را که امیدی به زنده ماندنش وجود ندارد برای مبتلا نشدن به درد و رنج مضاعف از بین برد به ایشو اف یوتنیسیا؟ If someone has no hope for treatment and no hope for life, he's going to die anyway. Is it okay to help him in finishing his life so that he would not suffer, he would not have more pain, or it's not good, we should not help him? آیا اخلاقا می توان به دلایل مختلف امنیتی قداست حریم زندگی شخصی افراد را شکست؟ Is it morally okay that for security reasons we disregard privacy of personal life of people or not? So these are issues that based on our normative ethics, based on our theory, we have to decide in a practical way so this is in a, uh, the book akhlaq karbordi page 47 i think it's a good way to explain but the way we discussed of course maybe it's more detailed after this the next thing that we want to discuss and make you more familiar with some of the theories about foundations of ethics is to refer to some most popular ideas about foundations of ethics i have selected few of them one of them is a very famous theory which is known as natural law natural law Uh, in uh, the science of law there is a theory called natural rights natural rights theory is different and you should not you know can be confused this is different although The idea of natural rights 
which is the school in the West about rights, about uh, law, and it goes to the time of Renaissance. It's promoted by people like Hobbes, Locke, Espinoza. It has relation with natural law, but it's different. We are not talking about natural rights. We are not talking about حقوق طبیعی. We are talking about قانون طبیعی. نظریه قانون طبیعی. Natural law theory. Natural law theory is rooted in ideas of some very ancient Greek thinkers. It is said that maybe the first person was Pythagoras. Pythagoras. Pythagoras, who lived 580 to 500 BC, before Christ. 580 to 500 BC. It's thought to be the first person who developed or mentioned this idea. He had the idea that the world has very solid and firm order based on mathematical rules. And human beings have to adapt themselves to this order of the world. So what you are supposed to do? You have to adapt yourself to the order of the world. Plato, Aflatun, who lived between 428 to 300 before Christ, he had this idea that if we want to form an ideal city, Ethiopia, we need to consider their being of a person as a model and bring it to the society. In a person, we have, as you know, three faculties. Al-Ghuvatul Aqila, Al-Ghuvatul Shahabiya, Al-Ghuvatul Ghababiya. He said, we should bring this into the society. In the society, we need government. We need different groups of businessmen, tradesmen, and we need army. Government acts like aql. The role of government is to understand interests and harms. And according to him, the best people to rule are whom? Philosophers. Because philosophers have knowledge and wisdom and they can act like brain, like act, like intellect for society. But we need also army, which is like al quwwat al qadabiya and we need bazarganan asnaf as qawwai shahawiyya. Of course, he even went further, and you know, according to what we have in books, he, they had the idea that even human race is very important. Some races are more suitable for physical work, physical activity. Some are more suitable for management and leadership and thinking. But what I want to say is that you see 
they try to use nature, creation, the world as it is, as the basis of their theory in ethics and politics. So this is a kind of natural law. It means the law which is based on nature. Aristotle, in his book, Politics, Af Plato, Aflatun discussed in the book, Republic, Jomhuriyat. What I said was from the book, Republic. But Aristotle in the book, Politics, Siyasat, denies and rejects the idea of the people who were against a slavery. He says the people who think a slavery is against nature, they are wrong. And he says nature itself has made the bodies of some human beings strong so that they can do more physical job and therefore he wanted to say it is natural, is compatible with nature or it is the law of nature to have a slaves. But you have to enslave people who are physically strong. Maybe this is the only thing they were adding as a condition. So, this idea that has its roots in Greek philosophy, Pythagoras to some extent, Plato to some extent, Aristotle, they have ideas that helped some Christian philosophers, especially in Christianity. This idea was developed into a kind of idea about foundation of ethics. And people like Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas have very much discussed this idea. And even St. Thomas Aquinas wants to say that St. Paul, we say Polos, Paul had also this idea. Let us mention as an example what Thomas mentioned, St. Thomas. You know St. Thomas Aquinas? He's a great uh, Christian theologian. Some people say he is like Ibn Sina for us. He is one of the most important doctors of the church. Doctor means those who have developed doctrines of the church. And especially for Catholics, he is very important. He has very huge book, Sama Theologica, Elahiyate Jami. And the style is very scholastic and very similar to Muslim thinkers. He had access to translations of Ibn Sina's work, Abyssina's work, and he is very close to Abyssina and he has been impressed and influenced by many ideas of Abyssina. He's a very good person to act as a bridge between Islamic philosophy and theology and Christian philosophy and theology. So, Thomas, St. Thomas, when he talks about Suisa, Khod Koshi, he mentions three arguments why suicide is wrong. The first argument is this. I have uh, translated into Farsi, of course, uh, what he said, and now I have to, I don't have the English text now with me, I am trying to translate back to English. Of course, he writes in Latin. He says, everything naturally loves itself. 
It's a law of nature. That everything by nature loves itself. Everything by nature tries to preserve itself and resists as much as possible against corruption, against destruction. Suicide, Thomas Aquinas argues, he says suicide is in conflict with natural desire of every living being <coughs> to survive. <coughs> if you look at animals, if you look at birds, plants, they all want to survive. They try to protect themselves, they try to eat, they try to do everything necessary to preserve their life. <coughs> Someone who is committing suicide is acting against the natural desire of every living being. <coughs> it is also in conflict with charity. Because every human being should be charitable, should be kind. And if you have to be kind and charitable with respect to others, then what about yourself? How can you be cruel to yourself? How can you destroy yourself? So Thomas says suicide is always a moral sin because it conflicts with the law of nature it also conflicts with child so as you see someone is using nature as the foundation for moral norms People who believe in natural law might be people who are believers or not believers in God. There are people who believe in nature and they may not believe in God or at least they may not believe in Abrahamic God. You know, there are many people, for example, in the uh, primitive tribes, in North America, in Latin America, in Africa, there are many human beings who have primitive life and they have some form of religions in which nature is very important. Maybe there is a spirit for nature which is like God for them. And for them it's very important that everything should be according to nature. But those who believe in God they are in a better position to take nature as a basis because they say God has book of creation and book of revelation and book of creation because it is designed by God manifest God's knowledge and wisdom so we need to reflect on it and act upon it there is a harmony between creation and legislation. So therefore, many Christian thinkers who are very deeply devoted to God, they believe in natural law theory. I have some reservations about this theory. I don't deny that there is something good and positive in this, but I have some objections. One problem with this theory is to define what is natural, what is compatible with nature, because according to them, what is natural is good, is right. You should do everything which is natural. It's not easy always to understand what is natural. For example, 
Is it natural for human beings to put on dress? Or it's not natural? What do you mean by natural? Na nature. Maybe someone says in nature, our body is exposed. So to put on dress and to cover ourselves is not natural. If you mean nature. If you mean human nature, then that's another issue. Inshallah, we will talk about it in the second view. Second view is human nature. But if you mean nature, means tabiat. Okay, maybe someone says in tabiat all animals are naked. They are exposed. So we should also be naked. I'm not saying this is right, but I'm saying if you say nature... And everything which is natural is good. How are you going to explain what is natural here? Or for example, in nature, human beings are not supposed to fly. Birds fly. Some animals fly, some animals swim, some animals crawl. Human beings walk or maximum is that they run. So to make planes and fly is it natural or it's not natural everything has a na natural taste if you add some sweetener to make something sweet is it natural or is it not natural St. Paul, Polos, as we say, or Bolos, as Arabs say, talks about men keeping long hair. He was against men having long hair. And he used to say, nature teaches us that for a man to have long hair is not good and for a woman to have long hair is good. Having long hair causes humiliation for man and causes honor and pride for woman. He wanted to argue for this based on nature. But it is not really clear that is it nature that men should keep their hairs, for example, short and women should keep it long? Or is it something that is based on our customs and cultures and maybe in early times human beings, even men had long hair, maybe in some cultures men had long hair. So, can you just decide based on nature such complicated issues? So, one difficulty at least with this theory, natural law theory, is that it's very difficult to define what is natural, what is tabi'i. The second question, suppose we decided and defined what is natural. Who said that everything which is natural is morally good? Are we able to find all moral values in nature? And all moral vices in nature. This makes uh, morality very basic. For example, you might say, okay, loyalty is good. Look at dogs who are loyal, for example. Or, uh, I don't know, generosity is good. Maybe then you bring some examples from nature. Uh, Haya is good. 
you mentioned, for example, Kraw, you know, Kalag, you know, has Haya. But morality is much more than this plus uh, why in nature you choose animals that you like for certain virtues so maybe for example if one animal is very uh, much uh, showing loyalty there are tens of animals that may not show loyalty or if one animal shows modesty maybe there are tens of animals that don't show modesty they can have you know sex you know <laughs> very clearly and you know publicly so it's not easy to draw all the values, all the virtues, or the opposite vices just by looking at nature. They say Agal can draw moral rules from nature. But this is not again clear how Agl can draw moral laws from nature. For example, birth control. Is birth control good or not? You know that actually Catholics, they don't believe in birth control and they just believe in natural birth control. So if someone uh, naturally cannot have more children because for example there are women who can only have child every three years every four years five years that's fine but they are against any method for planning family planning for birth control therefore they used to have many children and still some of them maybe have several children I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but I'm saying it's very difficult to say that as long as your nature and your body allows you to have child, you should have child. And it's immoral to have birth control. Although if you believe in natural law, maybe you say you should, but maybe someone says, no, you have to observe many other things. So if you want to bring Agl also here, Agl here would not have one opinion. Another thing is that, and Thomas Aquinas himself also has mentioned this, that many of the principles of natural law cannot be applied to all human beings without exceptions. Because human beings have great diversity, different races, but also different geographical, different historical conditions. So it's very difficult to have one rule for everyone. Another issue is that this theory can be misused. You know, some people used it to justify a slavery. Hitler actually used this to justify that Germans are better because of their race, their ethnicity, and they should rule. Some people justified apartheid based on this so this is something that can be also misused my suggestion is this instead of trying to make everything in morality out of nature we can say something else. We can say there are many things that may happen in nature. Animals may have different behaviors, you know, plants, so on and so forth. We are not going to details. 
from nature we can find out a general order general framework and we have to respect that so we should try to discover general order and general system of nature and we should observe that otherwise we will have conflict but not too much go to the details and try to justify all the details because even you can have conflicting details in the nature itself animals may have different behaviors some of the behaviors might not be moral so you cannot use every detail in nature but you can say your moral system must be compatible with the general order general framework of nature this is good and if you don't observe that you would waste lots of energy you damage humanity or damage nature which finally would damage humanity it should also be observed that we can many times change things in the nature you know uh, there is a discussion and some uh, especially non shia muslim scholars when it comes to issues like cloning like genetic engineering they say no one should change the creation of god any change any taghir in khalqullah in the creation of god is wrong shia jurists normally don't accept this and they say taghir fi khalqullah which we have in some verses for example in surah nisa verse 119 when shaitan says wala udhillannahum wala umanniyannahum wala amurannahum and it continues says fala yughayyirunna khalqallah or we have la tabdila li khalqillah some non shia or many non shia jurists they have taken this literally any change in khalqullah is wrong but shia jurists say no this doesn't mean any change because if any change is prohibited then farming is taghir fi khalqillah there is a land you cultivate it and you grow you make it a garden this is taghir in khalqullah if you want to take it literally there is no enough water you dig a well and then you reach water this is taghir fi khalqullah you make car you make a rail station you make plane everything is taghir fi khalqullah you make roads is taghir fi khalqullah the shia say no this is not the meaning of taghir fi khalqullah the meaning is to act against the legislation of god against the fitra and against the laws of god so this is also very important so many times we have to change nature allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually asked us wasta'marakum fiha ansha'akum fil ard wasta'marakum fiha so those who believe in natural law they should understand that they cannot stop people changing the nature yes change has to be in the way that helps and develops nature but doesn't damage Sorry. yes okay just a minute another thing is that we must so my, my final point we maybe say in this way and this is a very important point we can say that we must not conflict with the nature 
our moral system must not be against nature, conflict nature, but we cannot say nature dictates our morality. These are two different things. Nature dictating, teaching, inspiring us is something that we don't accept. But to say that as a requirement, you should observe nature and must be nature friendly, nature co compatible with nature is acceptable. Inshallah, we continue this discussion uh, next inshallah session. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. El Tamasa Dua, please.